Hello, students of statics. This is Dr. Dan Baker, and welcome to today's video looking at shear and moment diagrams. Just a little refresher. V is always shear as a variable, and M is always moment. And we can basically draw these shear moment diagrams, which are fundamentally looking at the internal loads inside of a body. In this case, it's going to be a beam. And noting that we're not looking at axial loads as part of this section. Fundamentally, we can actually relate shear and moment by calculus, but axial load is independent of those. Okay, so that's why we're going to focus here on shear and moment um, as opposed to bringing in axial loads as well. And so in looking at shear and moment diagrams, the idea of the diagrams is that we are going to draw the shear and moment M. Just a reminder, this is shear force and bending moment graphs for the whole length of a beam. Okay, so in the previous section we saw for shear moment and axial force at one particular place. But now we're looking at along the entire length because often what we're doing is we want to size a beam and we want to figure out where the maximum shear is, where the maximum moment is, where the values are, so that we can pick a, pick a cross section um, of a beam that's going to be plenty stiff enough to hold the load. Okay, so that's the general idea. Now there's actually three different ways, uh, three different techniques to draw shear and moment diagrams. All three of these are outlined in your textbook, in the engineeringstatics.org textbook. Now, the first method is called a section cut. And the section cut, cut technique looks a lot like finding shear and moment at one single point, except for when you cut it, you cut it in basically each loading segment, and then you write an equation, which is a distance variable equation. Okay. Uh, additional to talking about techniques, we're going to talk about advantages. Just with a little smiley face and disadvantages. Disadvantages. Okay. So the advantage of a section te cut technique is you can find your V and M graphs without calculus. And not only without calculus, without any knowledge of what calculus does, right? We're talking about the kind of calculus we're talking about here is that um, slopes are, are derivatives and areas are integrals, right? That basic level of kind of graphical calculus. We'll actually use that in the graphical technique, which is next. The disadvantage of section cuts, they're very math heavy. And the other problem with section cut um, probably because they're math heavy, is they basically, you lose any intuition as you're working through the problem. You're just going to get a number and go, yeah, I guess that's a good number. So math heavy and no visual feedback. The human mind's visual cortex is one of the strongest areas of our brain. And so it's really helpful if we can harness that visual cortex as we work through problems to try to spot any of our errors. Okay, so that's the section cut technique. Number two, which is the star of the show in my book, is the graphical technique. And the advantage of the graphical technique is it's gonna take advantage of your knowledge of slopes and areas, right? Slopes were, I'll just write this in the general form, dy dx, and areas, of course, the integral of something, we'll just put x dx, right? So as you think about calculus, you should think about that derivatives were slopes and integrals were areas. And so as you think about calculus, kind of the graphical level of calculus one, one of the first things you learned about were derivatives were slopes and areas were integrals, right? And so we're actually going to use those techniques 
um, in order to solve these shear and moment diagrams, because it actually turns out that shear and moment are related by an integral. Now the disadvantage of the graphical technique is it kind of reaches a limit. So reaches an upper limit when functions get complicated. So I'll highlight how this shows up, but fundamentally, if you need to find the area of a rectangle or the area of a triangle, I think we all could just do that. We know the equations up top of our head. If I ask you to find the area of a parabola, right, and then also the, the centroidal location of a parabola, you're going to start having to dig through some things to find those values. So since we're dealing with rectangles and triangles, um, it's really easy to use this graphical technique as we get into more complicated functions. Then we often are going to use number three, which is uh, the calculus-based technique. I'll put calculus equations. Now, of course, because all three of these techniques do the same thing, they help us draw shear and moment diagrams, it shouldn't be a big surprise that there are, there are strong parallels between all three of these, right? They're all based upon calculus. They all give you the same final answer. Um, the advantage of a calculus-based technique is that it, um, you can find the shear and moment equations for any loading. Uh, the disadvantage, it also is math heavy. Now, when I say math heavy, I'm really also saying here it's slow. Okay, so my chosen way through these problems is actually to use the graphical technique as far as I can and then if it doesn't take me quite far enough, I bring in a calculus equation or two, okay? But you're certainly welcome if you learn multiple techniques to check your work. And I'll also say that if you choose to use any technique to do your problems, that's totally fine with me. I can go through and grade any of these three techniques. But once again, the graphical is the fastest as you work through these problems. So the reason that calculus is so vital to your computation of these shear and moment diagrams comes back to the fundamental relationship that if we have a loading, right, W, if we want to find the shear of a given loading, we are going to integrate Right, integrate our loading to get our shear, which we often use capital V, and we would integrate again in order to get, uh, once again, integrate to get our moment. Okay, so we're basically integrating going from loading to moment. So it shouldn't be a big surprise that we're going to take derivatives Now, these are not time derivatives. These are space derivatives. Okay, so I could write here This is going to be the integral dx or integral dx and finally these derivatives are going to be a d dx, okay in dynamics we end up taking a lot a lot of time derivatives but here in statics, since nothing is actually moving, we don't need to worry about time as much. And so these are space derivatives with respect to the horizontal distance along that beam. So if we have these fundamental integral relationships, it shouldn't be a big surprise if we have, that we can relate this to polynomials. Okay, so if we look here at this table of these common relationships, that if I start with a zeroth order, okay, I start with a point load, and I find my shear, right, this is going downward, so this is my loading, my variables on here, loading W, shear, V, moment, M. So if we relate this idea of integrals 
to polynomial functions, right? So this is a point load. And a point load gives us basically an undefined distributed load. So it's not even like a zeroth order, because it turns out that a constant value is zeroth order, like x to the zero is equal to a constant value. Um, and then we have linear, right, which is a first order. So first order, we're talking about something to the x, and this would be x to the one, this is mean x to the zero, and this is x to the undefined. So if we start with an x to the zero, and we take an integral, we get an x um, to the one, which is linear, right, either positive or negative, this shows a negative slope, and then we end up here with an x squared right as we're increasing our polynomial order so over here we could say an x to the one and then we take a integral and we get x squared take another integral and we get x cubed okay so hopefully that helps you see how we have this integral relationship coming down here from load to shear to moment and it shouldn't be a big surprise that we have once again a derivative relationship opposite that integral d dx okay so we'll talk a lot about these slopes as we move forward in this content all right so let's go ahead and talk about the flow um, of solving one of these shear and moment problems okay so step one would be to find your reaction forces on a beam okay and you'll remember reaction forces right are come from supports right so essentially finding your pin forces and your roller forces it turns out that when we're going to solve for everything all the shear and moment inside the beam we, we can't handle any external unknowns okay so i'll put that as a sub note here find reaction forces on a beam um, let's go to eliminate any external unknowns all right step two is to draw a true loading free body diagram Okay, so when I talk about a true loading free body diagram, it looks something like this. Go ahead and draw this diagram at least, say, half the width of your paper. I'm going to continue some notes kind of going down beside it. So let's say that we have a triangular distributed load, which often as we think about this, we think about this as like W as a function of X. Right, so we often identify our x-axis going along the length. And so the true loading, what we're looking at, is that instead of taking this distributed load and turning it into a point load, we want to draw the shear moment diagram of the distributed load. Okay. Now, this would have, um, I chose supports. We'll actually move this one in just a little bit on this end. Okay, so... Um, I'd have, call this X1, call this Y1, and this over here, Y2. So Y2 is a roller. Uh, over at 1, we have a pin. And let's go ahead and also add a couple. Okay, that's applied right here at this point. So that is my load. Okay, so let me put a label here that says this is my load. And often we call load the capital letter W. Okay. All right. Now it's also quite convenient if you draw your shear and moment right below your true loading free body diagram. And as you do that, one thing you'll notice I'm going to do here, I'm going to draw some extension lines. And these become points of reference as I draw my other diagrams. Okay. So as we draw this shear moment diagram, I'm going to go through this kind of um, step by step and a cradle table. This is actually the same table you can find in your textbook. This is a table in the current numbering 8.4.9. It talks about um, jumps, slopes, and areas. Okay, so if we're looking at the shear, 
And so three columns here, jumps, slopes, and areas. So shear and moment. All right, so when we're talking about these areas, it turns out that I would mentioned that there's these um, fundamental calculus equations that relate shear moment. It turns out they relate actually loading to shear to moment. And so one of these is the change in my shear, delta V, is equal to the integral of W dx. Okay, so in words, we could say that this is the change in shear is equal to the area under the load. All right, and it turns out we have a parallel equation for my change in my moment equal to the integral of my shear dx. So in words, we can say this is the change in my moment is equal to the area under the shear. Okay, so that gives us one set of relationships. And finally, based upon these integral equations, we then can fill out the other two columns, which is looking at jumps and slopes. Okay, so the jumps, noting that the jumps are always going to be looking from left to right. Okay, so in the same direction that you read a book, always looking from left to right. So as we talk about jumps, jumps are going to be a vertical change on either your shear or your moment. It's the only vertical changes we'll see in our shear will be if we have an upwards point force, we'll end up with a upwards change in our shear. And if we have a downward point force, we end up with a downward vertical shift in our shear, okay? Force goes up, shear goes up. Force comes down, shear goes down. Now for couples and their jumps, we have to look at um, a couple moments, okay? And so a couple moment, of course, looks like this, a concentrated couple. So I'll write the rules below here, but fundamentally, if you have a negative from the right-hand rule couple, so this is, uh, let me put a little sign in inside here, so negative right-hand rule couple, this is going to lead in a um, upwards jump in your moment diagram. And if you have a couple going the opposite direction, Okay, so this is a positive right-hand rule, wrapping your fingers around to that arrow tip. We're going to end up with a downward jump in your moment diagram. Now, there's two ways you can look at this. You can look at it either opposite the right-hand rule, or if you think about these arrowheads, if you always draw them on the left side of the point of application, right, just like I did here, that these arrowheads here, right, that this arrowhead and this arrowhead generally point in the same direction, okay? But that's only if you draw them on the left. So let me write those out. So the two options is either one is opposite the right-hand rule or two draw on left follow arrowhead now i realize these are rotational vectors but i'm really just talking about if you draw on the left hand side and the the arrowhead is on the top part 
It's going to be a jump up, arrowhead on the bottom part, a jump down. Okay, so either one of those work. They basically are conveying the same information. The slopes are looking at changes basically from distributed loads and then kind of you know non-vertical changes in your shear. So looking at the slope, it's fundamentally going to be based upon these same calculus relationships. And so we can say the value of the load, so W, is equal to the slope of the shear, dv dx. And then the value of the shear, v, is going to equal the slope of the moment, dm dx. So I'll put both those in words. Value of load is the slope of the shear and the value of shear is the slope of the moment. So how that va manifests itself, basically if I end up with a value, a positive shear value, it's going to tell me that my moment slopes upwards, right? So if I have a negative shear value, that tells me that my moment will slope downwards, right? Value of the shear. And so same idea here that if we have a positive W, it means that we will have a V which slopes up this direction here. And a negative W, it tells me that my V will slope downward here. All right, so these are all the rules. Jumps, slopes, areas for graphically finding shear and moment diagrams. Let's put these to use, okay? So here is our loading curve. Next up, we're gonna draw our shear diagram. Once again, our shear diagram is a graph of all of the shear values along this x-axis. So we typically read these from left to right. Uh, again, any horizontal forces is gonna be independent of my shear or my moment. So this is going to be my shear diagram, which is going to be V. Now, notice on the left-hand end here, I have a jump upwards, right? I have a vertical force at the left end. We talked about that any upwards force gives me an upward jump in my shear. And it turns out not only is it in the same direction, it's the same value, okay? So the value at this point turns out to be y sub one, the value of my shear. Now over this next section here, this triangular load is gonna take over and it's gonna push that shear back down, right? Realize that this is a negative load, right? It's pushing downwards. Look at the arrowhead here versus the arrowhead here, right? It's pushing downward. Therefore, it's gonna decrease the value um, of my shear. And so we can look at this and say, well, it's gonna decrease it faster at the start and slower over here toward the end. Now we can also kind of take a look across this system here. One thing to notice is that this couple, C, will not influence my shear and moment diagram. Now it did influence the reactions that you saw for Y1 and Y2, but it will not show up in my shear and moment diagram directly. And so realize over here at Y2 that we also are going to have a vertical jump upwards, right? It's gonna be at negative Y sub two, and we're basically gonna jump up the same amount as that value. Another thing to recognize is there's no loading happening between this point here over to this point here. So if you know there's no loading and you know that the value of the load is the slope of your shear, there's no slope to your shear if there's no load, okay? So it's basically, it doesn't mean your shear is zero, it means it has a zero slope, so it doesn't change in value, okay? So now I've found kind of some ending points of this curve and realize that this curve here is a linear function, the negative linear function coming down this direction. So therefore we'll have a quadratic and that quadratic looks like this. We'll drop down here. Oh, let me draw that one more time, see if I can line this thing up. Drop down here, 
and then coming into basically right at this point here, zero value of your distributed load, right? It's approaching zero and then zero value here. So you don't get an inflection point because it has the same value on either side of that exact point, And therefore we don't get a change in the slope, right? Value of your load is the slope of your shear. Now, if we want to figure out um, how big this drop was, right? We talked about that the area under, or excuse me, the area under the load was the change in the shear. So if we find the area under here, okay? So this area is equal to one half base times height. It turns out that is also my delta V going from this point here down to here. Okay, so this is my delta V. And again, the reason that this is negative is that remember we could have actually drawn this triangle down below the x axis, right? If we'd wanted to, just kind of draw this in, in dotted lines. And so basically, I've just kind of slid that distributed load down below the beam. And so things that are happening below the beam, arrows going downwards, those are negative things going on. I shouldn't say just below the beam, but arrows going down versus arrows going up. That's why we have a negative change um, in our shear. All right, so the last piece here is to draw my moment diagram. And so the moment diagram, give myself a little bit more room here. I'm still gonna continue with these vertical lines. Here is my x-axis again. Here is my moment. All right. And so the only vertical changes we're going to have in our moment diagram, the only jumps are going to be due to couples. Otherwise, we're really going to lean real heavily on these slopes, right? So the slope right here, the value of the shear is the slope of the moment. And so if the shear is above the x-axis, that's going to mean a positive slope to the moment. Below the x-axis, a negative slope to the moment. Okay. Also noting that all shear moment diagrams are going to start and end at zero. Now, when I say start and end, I mean outside of any vertical forces. Right, so um, outside of y sub 2, basically to the right of y sub 2, to the left of y sub 1, it's going to be at 0. It's going to be the same thing here for the moment. I'm going to start and finish here at 0. So we're going to start with a small So we're going to start with a short interval of increase. Let me bring down one more point right here. Anywhere we actually have a zero shear value, we're gonna have a maxima or minima for our moment, okay? And so we get very steep value of the shear is the slope of the moment, okay? So high value of shear, but then that value of shear goes to zero, therefore I reach a maxima, which basically puts me at a concave down position and then I'm going to continue this downward trend, right? I reach the maxima right here. And my downward trend is going to stay concave down, changing in kind of steepness because fundamentally the amount of area down here quite, didn't quite get this drawn to scale. Um, but the amount of area here would need to be less than the amount of area here because the drop here is less than the rise over here. And now I look at my couple. So this couple is drawn on the left-hand side of the point of application, okay? So you can either read that the arrowhead is up. You can also read that it is negative from the right-hand rule. And if we do an opposite jump, we're going to jump upwards. The height of, oh, I, I missed it here. Let me come back. So my couple is here, and I have a jump upwards in this direction. So this was my positive jump from my couple. So the distance from here to here is that value of C. I'm going to continue going downward the whole rest of the journey. Now, 
uh, my slope is nearing a constant value. Okay, so a little bit of change through here, but then reaches, I'm gonna make that a touch deeper, a little bit of change through here, and then I'm gonna go straight line down to zero. Okay, so the reason I had a little bit of curvature change there is because the value of the shear changed, therefore the value of the slope here changed for my moment. And then once you reach this point right here, constant value of shear, constant slope. Okay, and zeroing out there at that last point. So I think we've looked at all the different aspects. Let me just highlight one more, and that would be that the slope of our shear, okay, so that's gonna be dx dv. So if I pick a point that's right in the middle there, that little slope triangle. So this value right here at w, call this w sub a, maybe you pick this point right here and call that a. So I could write that my dv dx is equal to w sub a, right? The value of your load is the slope of your shear. So to give us an opportunity to look at the graphs and also the guidance all in one view here, so once again, we had a triangular load. We solved for our reactions first, okay, before getting into the shear moment diagram. We found the numeric values here at point one and point two. We then drew the true loading free body diagram. With that true loading free body diagram, the first thing I typically look at are my jumps. Okay, so I had these vertical forces, one at the beginning, one over here at point two. I know what the vertical force, I mean the vertical step in my shear, right? Shot up here, went back up over here. So I know that in between here, it must cross over the x-axis, right? If I'm gonna go from positive to negative, it's gonna have to cross over at some point. And so this is where we get into that the area underneath your load is the change in that shear value. And so you can compute the area of this triangle. It's gonna be the same value we dropped here um, going from y1 down to negative y2. Uh, and that pretty much closed out our shear diagram, except for the fact that if you have no load, you have no change in your shear, right? Value of load is slope of your shear. For the moment diagram, a pretty similar type of analysis. The only way you'll have a vertical step on either the left or right end, te technically anywhere on a moment diagram, is if you have a couple. Okay, so we had one couple, it was in the middle, so therefore we're gonna start here at zero, end over here at zero. My value of shear was positive. It was fairly large. That gave me a steep slope up here. I had a maximum value where shear was equal to zero. I started to drop at that point, continued to drop until I hit my couple. Now the couple being negative from the right-hand rule or drawn the left-hand side with the arrow up means a vertical jump in the moment. And then I'm gonna to start to drop again, a small change in my slope of my moment from here to here, and then a constant value from this point down to there. It goes linear because we have a constant value of shear and closes down to zero. And so basically what we could do with this is you could um, compute not only what the maximum value of shear and maximum value of moment are, but you could also compute what the value is at any point along this curve, okay? So that's the general idea for shear and moment diagrams. I know that at the start, these will seem kind of foreign. They're a new topic to you, but I have confidence that with these techniques and also then supplementing with the calculus technique, and if you wanted to, the section cut technique, that you will be able to draw these um, not only here in statics, you also draw them in solids. And then if you're in mechanical engineering, you'll draw them in machine design. And if you're in civil engineering, you'll draw them in structures. Okay, so this is going to be a long standing topic in your engineering education. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for your effort. Thank you for your learning. Um, and I'll talk to you soon.